Hi, my name is Trevor Fraser, and I'm a surface water resources engineer with Stantec Consulting. Today at this Trieca 2018 conference, I will be speaking about how cool are cooling trenches in Kitchener-Waterloo area um, based on the trench monitoring that we've done over the past two years through our research and development program. On the agenda today, we've got an introduction to our cold topic. Uh, then we'll be moving on through cooling down the why and the how of cooling trenches, thermal mitigation, and the monitoring program. Then we'll move into the program itself, what we have done, where we've done it. Then we'll get into the interpretation of the results. Then move into other techniques with thermal mitigation. And then moving forward, what are the next steps in thermal mitigation and cooling trenches? So, introduction, a cold topic to talk about. What is thermal mitigation? Well, thermal mitigation is taking pond, stormwater management pond runoff that is quite warm from warming up in the facility, as well as from the asphalt of the developed land upstream and cooling it down to a temperature that is more better for the receiving natural system. We can do this through many different techniques. I will be focusing on cooling trenches today. However, in the MOE's 2003 Stormwater Management Planning and Design Manual, they actually outline several different techniques. Uh, the first one they look at is pond configuration based on length and width ratios, uh, riparian planting strategies, which go along with pond configuration, you can plant different plants to allow shading over a pond. And if your pond is a long and skinny pond, the shade can actually protect the pond from the sun and potentially provide some benefit there. Bottom draw outlets are outlets that are bottom drawn from the bottom of the pond. And obviously the water at the bottom of the pond is going to be cooler than that water that's sitting at the top. So if you're able to draw that bottom water, you'll have a cooler water to work with anyway. Uh, subsurface trench outlets, that's based on the cooling trench design. Uh, it's, as the name implies, subsurface. So it's underground where the temperature is more consistent. So it's cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. Nighttime release. Uh, nighttime release is a strategy that takes water, uh, it holds the water in the pond over uh, during the day, allowing it to warm up. No water is discharged during the day, but at night around 3, 4 a.m., the water has cooled down to a temperature that is uh, meets the requirements of the downstream creek, and then you discharge at that time. And then outlet channel design. You can provide a natural channel design that actually provides benefits to uh, discharge from storm water management ponds through cooling, uh, riparian strategies, as well as infiltration uh, and retention. So the process for cooling trenches or thermal mitigation in general, as you can see from this slide, rain falls onto developed land, mainly hot pavement and asphalt, uh, which is warmed up from the sun during the day. Rain falls on it absorbs the energy from the hot pavement, uh, creating warm runoff. The runoff then goes to the stormwater management pond or facility or whatever end of pipe uh, situation you have. Then the discharge is sent to some sort of cooling mechanism, similar to the ones we've recognized already from the MOE manual. And then after it's gone through the cooling, it goes into the downstream creek, hopefully at a much lower temperature or a temperature that is meets the requirements uh, of the downstream system. Now, cooling down, the why and the how of thermal mitigation. Why do we want to be cool in Kitchener-Waterloo? Well, the main thing here is fish. Uh, fish don't have any insulation in their bodies, so all their internal processes are uh, based on the ambient temperature around them. So if water warms up, then obviously their biological system is going to be changed and the processes could be affected. 
Now, this isn't always a big issue if you're in a warm water tributary. Some fish like warm water. However, in the Kitchener-Waterloo area, there are several areas of cold water creeks with fish that are sensitive to cold temperatures. Uh, even a one to two degree change can completely affect their system. Um, in our area, it's mostly brook trout, brown trout, and rainbow trout that are affected um, by warmer water. Subwatershed studies typically allow or give design criteria for these creeks. Um, and when you get into the design of developments, you would follow these criteria um, that would give you a target discharge temperature, for example, 25 degrees, so that your pond temperature, which might be at 35 degrees in July, uh, discharges at 25 degrees or lower, um, meeting the target from the subwatershed studies. There are also regulations and policies set out from the uh, federal government through the DFO, and then also on a provincial level from the MNR and the MOE, as well as the Planning Act. And then of course, on a more regional scale, you've got conservation authorities providing uh, design criteria as well. In particular in Kitchener-Waterloo, as everyone knows or may not know, there is a lot of development happening and we need to be cognizant of uh, the effects that we may have on downstream temperatures in creeks. And now how to be cool in Kitchener-Waterloo? Well, there are many different approaches over the years that have been used, as I've discovered through the designs that Stantec has done. Uh, the designs have evolved over time. Um, they've started pretty rudimentary and then gotten much more detailed as we've uh, moved forward over the past 15 years. Uh, basically, we've looked at subsurface outlets that just discharge directly underground. Uh, we've also looked at residence time calculations, which are based on flow path, how long the water is sitting in the cooling trench, as well as heat transfer calculations, which are much more uh, complicated, which is what we've actually been using more recently. The heat transfer is based on the energy from the stormwater management discharge into the cooling trench itself, whether that's to groundwater or to the uh, gravel in the cooling trench. Uh, and then you look at the different heat transfer between those different media. Um, as I mentioned here, groundwater is another media medium that you can use. And basically what we're looking for right now is consistency. Consistency on both the design criteria standpoint from conservation authorities and municipalities, as well as a consistent uh, approach from the designers themselves uh, so that we can use the same sort of design each time and uh, we can monitor the results accordingly. Here is a brief uh, cross section. It might be difficult to read. Um, but it gives you a general idea of how a cooling trench works or how it's designed. So you can see the outlet riser on the left of your screen, which is a typical riser uh, from a stormwater management pond, discharging at low flows to a cooling trench, which is underground. Uh, the top pipe is perforated and water will discharge uh, through gravity down to the lower pipe, which is also perforated at the top. Water will get into this pipe and then discharge to the downstream manhole after traveling the length of the cooling trench, um, which allows it to pass through the colder temperatures underground, whether again that's through the gravel or uh, the gravel clear stone of the trench itself or through groundwater. And it will discharge into the manhole and through hydraulic pressure will discharge out of the outlet pipe to the downstream system. Here's a, I just want to show you some pictures of a cooling trench being built. As you can see from the scale here, that hole in the middle of the screen is the hole for the cooling trench. It's about two meters deep. And as you can see, quite large based on the, the size of the equipment there. This is a few days later after they've uh, installed the clear stone as well as the perforated, uh, dis, uh, perforated distribution pipes. But you can see it's still quite a bit lower than the actual pond bottom. 
Here it's being filled in. This is now the bottom of your permanent pool area. Those pipes to the left of the screen are clean out pipes, which will extend up to ground surface. So it gives you an idea of how deep this uh, cooling trench goes. And here's your finished product um, from the same angle. So this is your pond, a typical stormwater management pond. On your left are where the clean out pipes are and they're now at ground surface. So it just gives you an idea of the scale of these things. So now into the monitoring program itself. Uh, specifically, we've got two trenches that we monitor in the city of Waterloo. We've got three trenches in the city of Kitchener, one trench in Elmira, which is north of Waterloo, and one trench in the booming metropolis of Baden, which is west of Kitchener near New Hamburg. Uh, here's a picture of how we what we do for these uh, for the monitoring program so in each trench we've got two data loggers set up at 15 minute in intervals or taking data at 15 minute intervals and we've got one logger in the pond itself near the outlet as shown in this picture uh, the, the data logger extends into the permanent pool and is measuring the temperature of the water that is leaving the pond prior to the cooling trench this picture is at the downstream end of the cooling trench. Typically, we have a manhole that uh, receives the water from the cooling trench prior to discharge. So we install a PVC pipe to the ladder of the manhole and the data logger extends down into the sump to measure the cooling uh, capacity of the cooling trench. I also highly recommend hiring a co-op student with long arms to do this work. Um, as they're cheap and uh, expendable. <laughs> so we've looked at different design parameters uh, to test the effectiveness of the cooling trenches in our monitoring program. Uh, obviously upstream catchment area characteristics such as uh, area as well as impervious coverage will affect the water going into your pond and your cooling trench and obviously will affect the sizing and design of your cooling trench. Groundwater is another big component to cooling. Groundwater is a media that is not infinite, but essentially infinite on a relative scale to the cooling trench. And if you have high groundwater and can use it to help cool down the water, then it seems to be a very effective way of cooling water. Residence time and flow path. Um, if you're able to keep water in a cooling trench for a long period of time, as well as extend its flow path, this will also benefit and be very effective to cooling water. Your length to width ratio of your cooling trench itself, uh, the longer and skinnier trenches tend to work better as opposed to one that's more of a square shape. Uh, the outlet design of the pond, the outlet design such as a subsurface or a uh, bottom draw outlet, as I mentioned earlier, is going to benefit the water that is actually leaving the pond, which requires less cooling from the trench itself, which may reduce the size of your trench, as well as the cost. Uh, these trenches aren't cheap, and if you do a cheap trench, typically the results will show that they don't work quite as well. They still work, but not as well. Now moving into the results, graphs, numbers, etc., from the monitoring program. Here's a graph showing the results of the cooling trench that is located in Waterloo at a site called Woolwich Estates. As you can see on this, on this figure, the blue is the precipitation, orange is the temperature in the pond, and the black line is the temperature at the cooling trench. Obviously, you can see that there is a significant change uh, in temperature after going through the cooling trench. Um, this is working very well. Uh, this particular cooling trench is located in the groundwater and it has quite a long flow path as well. Here is a very, it might be difficult to see, but here is a drawing showing the cooling trench that is working really well at Woolwich. The cooling trench actually extends around the entire perimeter of the pond, so its flow path is almost 500 meters, which is great. It's also located in the groundwater, as I mentioned earlier. 
So between those two factors, the results are obviously reflecting how well it's, uh, it's working. Here is a cooling trench, uh, put it not working. It is working still, it's just not working as well as the previous trench. Uh, this trench is much smaller and is much older as well. It is not located in the groundwater, but you can see from the orange, which is still the cooling trench, uh, or is, orange is still the temperature of the pond, where and black is the cooling trench outlet. You can still see that the cooling trench is providing some thermal mitigation, just not as much as the previous example. It's only, this particular trench is only showing one to two degrees change. And here's a drawing of that trench. And so this is, this was installed in around 2006 or 2007. And the trench itself is only about 45 meters long and only four meters wide. So the residence time and travel length in the cooling trench itself is not nearly as long as the previous example and it's also not located in the groundwater so you're not getting the same level of cooling as you were in the previous example on this particular graph uh, we show the average change in temperature across the cooling trench uh, as you can see the orange and the blue bar graphs are showing significant changes, the orange being the example I showed you earlier, approaching a an average change of nine degrees across the trench. Uh, then the blue to the left is another site that is similar to similar in design to the orange uh, graph. However, it is not quite as long. The flow path is, it's as I mentioned earlier, a longer, skinnier cooling trench is much better than a square trench. In this case, uh, the blue is a square trench, so you can see the change that, that makes. They're both in the groundwater, so it's a good comparison to make. The darker blue is a site that is much smaller and cost effective. It's located, however, it is located in the groundwater, which is the reason it's providing such uh, good thermal mitigation. The other three trenches are all much older and are not a not located in the in the groundwater and are also much smaller, so they don't have that same residence time and flow path that the other three have. Um, they're much older. They are still providing some level of uh, thermal mitigation. So depending on your downstream criteria, they may actually be working and providing what you need. If you've got a inlet temperature of 26 degrees and your target is 25, well then these cooling trenches still are providing what you need. So what have we found? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, groundwater, putting your trench or installing your trench into the groundwater is a very effective way of getting very large changes in temperature across your cooling trench. Um, this is mostly because you have essentially an infinite amount of groundwater to work with. Uh, now the question is, does the cooling trench or does the warm water from the cooling trench heat up the groundwater? It will, but given the size of the groundwater and the amount of volume you have its effect will be very minor however it would be an interesting uh, program to see if there or if we could even measure this what kind of change it has on the groundwater you also need to be careful of water quality the water quality coming out of your pond should be okay to put into the groundwater since we're sending it to our downstream system anyway but you do need to be mindful of uh, issues such as chloride from your upstream development as well as sediment and any clogging that could happen in the cooling trench as well. The outlet design of the pond is also may have an effect. Uh, bottom draw outlets tend to draw cooler water from the bottom of your pond. Depends on the depth of the pond and the design of the pond. Um, so sending cool, cooler water to a cooling trench to start will also uh, increase how much cooling you're going to get. And then residence time and flow path, as we've discussed, uh, the longer the flow path, the longer the residence time in the trench, and the longer the warm water has to make contact with cooler, the cooler media, whether that's your clear stone in your trench 
or the groundwater uh, that's that's cooling the clear stone. And finally, cost. <clears throat> More money is generally leads to less problems and generally leads to cooler temperatures as well. However, having said that, the one example we show we showed on that bar graph showed that a cheaper trench is actually still operating and functioning well um, and providing thermal, uh, significant thermal mitigation, uh, five to six degrees change. So it may just be a result of being in the groundwater, um, which is, as we had mentioned, a more effective way of cooling water. Where are we going next with thermal mitigation? Well, we know about low impact development or LID, um, treating at sources obviously a preferred method rather than going to end of pipe, which is the approach that the MOE and we have all taken uh, for the past 15 years, sending water into the ground at the source and reducing your total volume to your pond will always be a better way of approaching thermal mitigation. Having said that, you can have cooling trenches at source uh, in a system such as the Etobicoke system. You can sort of mimic infiltration, but also cool water if your soils don't permit it. Um, we're not sure what the MOECC design guidelines will have for cooling, whether there is any thermal mitigation proposed in them. I believe the majority of the design changes or design criteria will be related to low impact development, which again, will uh, improve the downstream uh, temperature of your stormwater discharge. A multi-component approach is probably the best way to uh, come at cooling or that thermal mitigation. Low impact development, again, upstream treating at source, as well as a downstream system that takes, uh, say, road drainage or something like that. Uh, that allows for cooling as well downstream, you're obviously gonna get your best results when you have multiple designs or multiple strategies in the same design. And given that LID is on its way, is there even a place for cooling trenches moving forward? LID isn't necessarily the answer to all life's problems. Um, not every site is, uh, is appropriate for LID measures. And so cooling trenches may still have a place in stormwater management design. Cooling trenches can be put into areas with high groundwater where LID is potentially not possible, as well as areas with very tight soils that don't allow for infiltration. So there may still be a place for them, but we should approach each site uh, appropriately and uh, use our judgment to put in the correct design. Are there any questions?